Good morning. Welcome back to Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. After a long and cold week here in the heart of America, the sun is shining, the snow is melting, and we're here in God's house ready to listen to his word and study the scriptures with you. We thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Pastor Wayne Hebner. With me this morning is Vicar Brett Jones. Brett is a third year student at Concordia Seminary here in St. Louis. He's in the middle of a year long internship at our congregation and he'll be my wingman this morning as we carry on with our Bible study. Also this morning in the balcony here at Salem Church are Mr. John Whitmer, who is our videographer, and Josh Hahn is with us. Josh is our second year seminarian from Concordia Seminary, and he'll help field your questions and comments from home as the hour proceeds. We welcome all of you who are joining us this morning on Facebook Live. We invite you to let us know you're there. Uh, type in a comment or a hello this morning. Let everybody know you're out there. We also welcome those of you listening by our telephone ministry and participating in the Bible study in your home. Or maybe you're out in the car on the road today. It's also a great way to uh, participate in our Bible studies on the road. You can do so by phone. We know many of you do this each week. All right, this morning we're starting something new in our Sunday morning Bible study, a series called Eyes on Jesus. And some of you may already know that this dovetails with the Wednesday afternoon and evening theme that we're following for the Lenten season. Ash Wednesday, of course, was this past Wednesday, the beginning of the 40-day Lenten season. This year, our theme is Eyes on Jesus, as we take a look at how people saw Jesus as he carried out the work of our salvation and went to the cross for us. We'll also see how Jesus sees us with his eyes. And the lessons for this series are based on the gospel according to St. Mark. So we started last Wednesday with misjudging eyes, and that will be the theme of today's study. Why don't we begin with an opening prayer? And we have a prayer that is, uh, I think, might be on the screen, depending on how the study guide uh, plays it. But uh, let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And that's the prayer for Ash Wednesday, which began the Lenten season. Well, I want to welcome Vicar Brett Jones. Good morning, Vicar. You're Good looking morning. hale and hearty today and uh, ready to go as we are engaged by God's Word. So uh, let's take a look at the series introduction. And we want to uh, remember that this theme, Eyes on Jesus, does come from the Scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we read these words. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That verse has been adapted for what we call the gradual during the Lenten season. The gradual is a verse that's sometimes read between the Old Testament reading and the epistle. Sometimes it's read between the epistle and the gospel. But I think um, many of our churches use this as a weekly verse for that season of Lent uh, as the scripture readings are read. We want to take a look at uh, Mark's gospel and see how various people around Jesus viewed him, particularly during the time of his passion and his death, and yes, even his resurrection. In most cases, we see that people misunderstood who Jesus is and what he was doing. But there are people, especially in Mark's gospel, who do see him rightly by faith. And that's what we ask God's Holy Spirit to do for us, to see him rightly, and to fix our eyes on what Jesus has done to save us. As Martin Luther says in the explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed, with his holy, precious blood, 
and his innocent suffering and death. We also celebrate what God sees in us on account of Jesus' work, namely that we are counted right with God, or we say justified for Jesus' sake. So with that, uh, we're going to focus our eyes on Jesus Christ, crucified, died, buried, risen for our justification. This is a vision that will never disappoint us. Or by trusting in Jesus, we see his promises that we will gaze upon his beautiful face in his heavenly paradise forever. All right, well, that is a brief introduction to the Eyes on Jesus series and to today's lesson. We want to take a look now uh, a little more carefully at what we talked about on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to see how Jesus had predicted for his disciples that he was headed for the cross, that he was chosen by God and set apart to offer a sacrifice for our sins, that he would be crucified, die, and on the third day rise again. But as we already know from our uh, study of the gospel according to St. Mark, most people just didn't get this. Even the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. One of the people who seemed to have at least some idea of what Jesus was about to do is this woman we meet in Mark chapter 14. Now, one of the things that we have touched on in our other studies and sermons over the years is that when you read the Gospels, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they sometimes overlap, they sometimes tell the same events in different ways, and we're going to restrict ourselves or limit ourselves to what Mark's Gospel tells us. And uh, the reason I bring this up is this woman in Mark's Gospel is not named. She is intentionally kept anonymous. We know, I believe from Luke's Gospel, that this woman was Mary of Bethany, Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus, but in Mark's Gospel she's not named. So we're going to pretend that we don't know who it is because in Mark's account uh, she, her name is not given. Why was she unnamed and what did she do? We're going to talk about that today. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Vicar Brett to lead us in reading the uh, Bible lesson we have for today, which we also had Wednesday, Mark 14, verses 1 through 9. I've been doing all the talking, so now it's your turn. That's all right. And indeed, we're going to be reading from the ESV version of the Bible, just so you are. Uh, that is the version that we re read during uh, Bible studies and also that we use during our worship services. So if you have a different translation, the words might be a little bit different, but it, it is no nothing to worry about. So with that, let's begin. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And uh, thanks for sharing that reading with us. Uh, for many of you, I'm sure those words sound familiar because we just heard them a few days ago. If you worshiped with us at Salem or at home on Ash Wednesday, that was the sermon text and the sermon theme. And we talked a lot about what is going on. 
But in a Sunday Bible study setting, now we have a chance to go a little bit deeper. We also have a chance for you to respond and to offer your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. So if you are with us on Facebook Live this morning, we would love to hear from you. Josh Hahn and John Whitmare are in the balcony and they are ready to receive your comments and questions about this unusual text, a strange event to be sure. And uh, let's see if we can have a discussion today. Why do you think the woman did this? What was its significance? How did the people at the dinner respond? And most importantly, how did Jesus respond? So let's keep going then. You should be able to see on the right-hand side of your screen our study guide, which begins with question number one. When Mark begins his passion narrative, and again, that word passion, uh, in Bible study, it refers to all of the events leading up to surrounding the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So the passion starts traditionally at um, Palm Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem that final time. Sometimes Palm Sunday is called the Sunday of the Passion. So I want to make sure that we define our terms a little bit. When Mark begins his passion narrative by mentioning the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, along with the fact that the Jewish leaders were seeking to kill Jesus, what is to evoke in his readers' minds. Now, remember that um, in uh, this account and the others, we know that the reason everyone was coming to Jerusalem was the annual celebration of the Jewish Passover. It reminded the people of how God rescued them from slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land of Canaan. And this Feast of Unleavened Bread was that meal that went along with the Passover. Remember on the night that the Israelites left Egypt, they ate unleavened bread, uh, drank red wine, ate lamb, bitter herbs, and so on. And if you've ever been part of one of those uh, Christian Seder meals, a reenactment of the Passover, you have a pretty good understanding of uh, the significance of that uh, meal. So we're talking now about this Old Testament background. And Mark is steeped in the Old Testament. Uh, Mark is a Jewish writer writing primarily for the Jews and also for Gentiles, uh, but he had a lot of help in his work from Simon Peter. And uh, Simon Peter, very much proud of his Jewish heritage and would have had uh, also a, a solid background in the customs and traditions of his people. So let's just take a quick look at a couple of these Bible verses that are mentioned here. Uh, first, we have John chapter 1, verse 29, and this is uh, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John identified Jesus as God's great Passover lamb. And then we go ahead to 1 Corinthians in chapter 5. We have verses 6 to 8 talking about this uh, matter of unleavened bread. Unleavened meaning it was pure without uh, decay from the yeast or other leavening agents that cause things to break down. They make things rise and taste good, but they also cause this decay. So unleavened bread doesn't have this. Your boasting is not good, Paul says. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So all of this marks Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover is associated with this, and uh, this is what's going on now as the background to today's Bible reading. And I see Josh waving his arm furiously in the balcony, which means he's got a question or comment from someone on Facebook. What's going on, Josh? Yep, we have a question from Art. Uh, was this oil, which was probably olive oil, suffused with the essence of spikenard, also used in burial rituals like frankincense and myrrh? 
Art had a question about what is uh, being poured over Jesus' head. Is this oil uh, spiked with nard and so on? Uh, we're not exactly sure what kind of ointment. It's some sort of a perfume, and uh, it is also some kind of a preservative. I think nard would fit the bill. Um, I'm not sure about frankincense, which was more of a worship uh, substance that would have been burned and, and, you know, the smoke of incense going up, but perhaps myrrh, uh, which was the spice. Uh, remember the three gifts of the three wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm sorry, not the three wise men, but the three gifts of the wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was the uh, resin, a sweet-smelling uh, spice that would have been used in burial customs and possibly part of what this woman uh, poured over Jesus' head. So we have these Jewish religious leaders seeking to kill Jesus. They want him out of the way because he is inconvenient for them. He is upending and overthrowing their entire religious system. Remember, he's not a revolutionary. Jesus did not come to overthrow the Roman government, but he came to uh, reform and return the church of his day to the pure teaching of God's word of law and gospel. And this is something that goes on throughout history, Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, as Lutherans, we of course see many of the same kinds of things happen in the Lutheran Reformation in the 16th century after Christ. So with that then, we've got these Jewish leaders plotting, setting the stage for what is to come, but Jesus isn't quite ready yet to become the Passover lamb. First, he had to be anointed. Let's talk a little bit about anointing, and uh, Vicar Brett, maybe you can start by leading us through that second question, and then uh, some thoughts on that. Uh, certainly. Uh, and. What a wonderful discussion we had on the first question because that really leads up into uh, what happens in our account today and also all of what Pastor just talked about informs exactly how these different people acted at uh, the house. So let's start with the actions of the unnamed woman who anointed Jesus. Uh, this is an act of love. Um, remember that... Uh, uh, it's not just like you know today where if you need to go get some oil or even a fragrant oil you can run down to the mall and purchase one uh, pretty easily this this would have been a very expensive uh, a very expensive thing that she that she did as you can see by what the the, the scribes said to her that this would have been 300 denarii. I remember that a denarii was about a day's work, and uh, I believe our leader guide says this would have been a, around, this could be around $30,000 worth of, of precious material that she has just uh, put, on our, put on Jesus. So this would be almost like spending an entire year's salary on your engagement ring for your, for your future fiance, not just the old two months worth, but this would be the entire year. And would the, make your jeweler very happy. Yes, your jeweler would be, would be ecstatic. And, and that would be something that is carried with you for the rest of your life. This ointment is, uh, is something that was used up in a, in a very quick manner. So, just to give you an idea of the scale of the amount of love that this woman is showing to Jesus, it is absolutely immense. And then you take a look at what the leaders and the scribes say to her, and they, they stand in almost complete opposite to, opposite to, opposition to each other. You have an act of love and an act of hatred. Because remember that the, they are... In the back of their minds, as we talked about in the first question, they are already plotting to kill Jesus. So when you're, that shows that they, they have no value for him. They, they want him gone. So when this woman expresses uh, a tremendous amount of love for Jesus, what is their reaction? Well, you wasted this on him. Why would you do that? You could have spent this money and given it to the poor. Uh, as, as we noted, uh, as Pastor noted in his sermon this week, this would have been more money than would have been required to feed the 5,000. 
Why did you waste that all on him? This man is of no value. And they almost kind of uh, intimidate her. And you can, you can see that by what Jesus says in verse 6 when he says, Why do you trouble her? Leave her alone. So not only do they, uh, they, uh, they, they don't just seethe with anger, they actually lash out at her for doing this. And Jesus corrects them by saying, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Unlike the, uh, the religious, religious leaders, this woman has an idea of the importance of Jesus and also what is to come. And that uh, she is not only you know, anointing him in spices, <clears throat> excuse me, spices that would be used in burial. And uh, Jesus, Jesus tells her that this, this act will be remembered. And, and uh, this is uh, something that you can probably think of uh, a time in your life where someone important to you showed you a tremendous amount of love through action. This is what, this is what we have here. And Jesus, this will be remembered until the last day. See, Josh has a, a, a question or a comment from the balcony. What do you have, Josh? Sorry about that. My, I forgot to turn the mic on. Uh, so we have a question from Donna Walter. She says, wait, I missed something. Are you saying the people who plotted to kill Jesus were the same ones who objected to the anointing? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can answer that because I, I did a little bit with this on the sermon uh, this week. We're not exactly sure who was all at this dinner. And one of the things that you have to bear in mind when you read any, <clears throat> excuse me, any of the Passion accounts from the four Gospels is that when you'll hear a reference, for example, particularly in John's Gospel to the Jews, Let's not think that this is a monolithic group of people, all of whom thought exactly the same way. We know, of course, that there were different political and religious parties among the Jews. The Pharisees were much different from the Sadducees. One thing that they did agree on is that Jesus of Nazareth must go. But of course, there were many Jewish people who were sympathetic to what Jesus of Nazareth had been teaching and preaching. There were many who saw his great works of mercy and kindness, who recognized in him the authority from God to preach and teach and heal and so on. So, who is at this dinner? Uh, we're told it was at the home of a man named Simon the leper, uh, who was maybe someone that Jesus had healed. And you get a sense that, as is often the case at a large gathering, uh, there's a lot of different folks there. And it is certainly possible that of, among the guests at this dinner were members of these uh, factions, the Pharisees and the Sadducees especially, who wanted to do away with Jesus. We get a sense that this is a, a kind of uh, maybe upper uh, class, upper social, socioeconomic class event. Uh, this is not attended perhaps by common laborers, but uh, people who are the movers and shakers in uh, Jerusalem. And so it's quite possible that among these guests were people who were already plotting to put Jesus of Nazareth to death. We just don't know, but I think it's a pretty safe guess uh, given the fact that uh, there were so many people in Jerusalem crowded in for the Passover. I hope that answers Donna's question. All right. So uh, why don't we move now into a discussion of what would be the third question in our study guide and talk a little bit more about what it means to be anointed, anointed. Now, if you recall, in your vast reservoir of Hebrew knowledge, there is a Greek word that means the, I'm sorry, there is a Hebrew word that means the anointed one, which um, you may not know in Hebrew, but I'll bet you know in English. In Hebrew, it comes out as Mashiach, Mashiach, which means to anoint somebody with something pour something on somebody for the purpose of setting that person apart for a particular work. Now in English, of course, that comes in as the name Messiah, and I think most of us know that. 
Messiah is translated into the Greek language as Christos, which of course in English is Christ. So Messiah, Christ, both mean the anointed one. What does it mean to be anointed? We have a reference here in the study guide from Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Peter says, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power by his Father. Well, that's the baptism of Jesus, where that voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him. When we think about being anointed, we can also think about other things that were poured on Jesus' head. Certainly the water of baptism when John baptized him in the Jordan River. Here we see Jesus anointed in a different way with this jar of perfume, this alabaster flask of perfume poured on his head. And the study guide references a couple of places, one Old Testament and New Testament, that, <coughs> excuse me, that talk about Jesus becoming our great high priest. In Exodus chapter 29 verses 7 to 9, this is the Lord's instructions to Moses about anointing or setting apart priests like Aaron and the rest. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them, and you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them, and the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. We still talk about putting a pastor into office today as an ordination, a setting apart, choosing someone for a specific task. And let's see, we wanted to look at that verse in Hebrews as well. Let me find Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verses 23 through 27. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, meaning Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Of course, by the time the writer to the Hebrews wrote, Jesus had risen from the dead. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We see in this reading a bit of what it means to be a priest. You have these priests set apart for their work by having oil poured upon their heads. This is what it means to be anointed. Jesus is set apart as our prophet, priest, and king. A prophet is someone who speaks forth or tells forth God's words. Jesus does that uh, in the New Testament, but also today through the office of preaching and teaching, the pastors, teachers, and others in the church. A priest offers a sacrifice to God on our behalf. Of course, Jesus did this at the cross where he died in our place but he still intercedes for us. He is our go-between with God the Father, pleading our case, begging his Father to forgive our sins for his sake. And Jesus is our king. We recall how Saul and David and the other kings of Israel were anointed with olive oil and set apart for their office. Jesus rules a kingdom of power, grace, and glory, and he will be our king forever. The priests that came before Jesus all died and were buried, and the office was transferred to the next generation. But by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus endures forever. He remains as our high priest. There is a sense in which Jesus is the once and for all high priest, different from those in the Old Testament. So with that, we see Jesus set apart for his work, Now we're going to start talking about how Jesus carried out this work and what its significance is for us. So uh, with Vicar Brett, um, what do we have in question number four? This note that Jesus makes that this woman and her actions would be remembered wherever the gospel is proclaimed. What's that all about? Well, let's let's take a look at the word gospel. Now, uh, 
the term gospel is more prominent in Mark's gospel than uh, the writings of the other evangelists. Uh, let's let's kind of think about the word that's used for gospel, uh, both in its use in well, the, the, what we consider the Gospels today, as well as uh, the same word that's used in the surrounding culture. So the, uh, the word that is used for Gospel in Greek is huagalion, and I apologize to Art if I, if I mispronounce that. Uh, but this word is not unique to the Bible itself. Um, it was also used in Greek culture uh, for a few, for for proclamation of good news, especially surrounding a military victory. Uh, there are uh, accounts of this term being used uh, to celebrate the, a naval victory, a victory uh, by cavalry, and the capture or a death, I'm sorry, sorry the capture of a city-state or an enemy being put to death. Those would be considered good news. Uh, anytime you, if you've lived, and anytime you can think of, any time that we were uh, at war in this country, I remember as a young boy uh, watching uh, the evening briefings during Operation Desert Storm, and uh, they would all. Whenever the uh, generals would come on, they would always share news of victory in order to rally the people at home around, uh, around the effort. So this idea of good news is steeped in, in Greek culture. It also links back to Hebrew culture. Uh, the word in, in Hebrew that is used in the, that is substituted in the Septuagint, which was the Greek version of the Old Testament, is a bizarre, and that also has a connotation specifically of good news. Uh, frequently either, again, the winning of a battle or something uh, that is life-changing, like the birth of a firstborn son. So this idea of good news is what the entire gospel of Mark is about, the good news of the work of Jesus. So let's take a look at why this is central to the mission of the Christian church. So let's start by reading uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, which says, And wherever he enters, he is to say to the master of the house, oops, I'm sorry, I'm in Mark chapter 14, not Mark chapter 1. Um, Thank you. That's okay. Uh, the reason it's on my mind is that's our, um, the gospel for this Sunday, as a matter of fact, comes from uh, Mark chapter 1, and in verse 14, uh, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's when he came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So we see that from the very beginning of Mark, um, you remember the very first verse, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then the rest of the book will unfold what that good news is, and we see Jesus bringing that. So um, that's where it starts, and this is what Jesus is doing, as you well pointed out, victory over sin, death, and the devil. Uh, what about Romans 1.16? That's another one of those passages that's so familiar, and it talks about the significance of the gospel in our lives. What's that all about? Yeah, it is the, the power of God for salvation to all who believe. And in Colossians 1, Paul also <clears throat> talks about this as being the word of the truth. This is what we know to be the good news that surrounds our Christian life. Uh, it, it frames our entire existence as Christians that we, uh, that we have received the good news of Jesus' work for us. And then one, one of the fruits of this, good, of this gospel, this good news, is that we have a response to it in good works. Uh, and this is, these are both good works that are done by the disciples. Uh, they, gave to, they gave to the needy. They, they helped people. Uh, specifically, we can think of uh, Matthew, Matthew 6, verse 2, and then after we, uh, 
after we read this verse, we're going to get into the next question that, that uh, talks about uh, the poor. So let's read Matthew 6, verse 2, which says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So, Pastor, what are some of the other things that uh, surround uh, giving to the needy? Yeah, let's start with that good works. Um, I, I think it bears mentioning that what you just read from Matthew 6, that's the gospel appointed to be read on Ash Wednesday. Now, we didn't hear that at Salem uh, this year. Uh, we heard the, the gospel from Mark instead, but I'll bet that there are some of our Bible study participants who either heard that this year or remember from other years the warning from Jesus not to try to do good works to be praised by other people or to show off in front of God and uh, human beings. That's not the reason for doing good works, and that is not a good work in God's sight. Good works in God's sight come from the gospel as Christians live out their vocations and are content to do them without being noticed by anyone else. If you look at what this woman did, uh, she was not intending to gain the approval of the people at this dinner. Quite the opposite. She was ridiculed by them. Uh, she made a mess of things. She broke this uh, flask and dumped it over Jesus' head. And, and I tried to convey in the sermon on Wednesday, you know, you can imagine uh, Jesus. You ever have, like, cold water dumped on you? Or, you know, you step outside and slam the door, and then the snow falls off the roof on a day like today and covers you. You just kind of get hunched down, and you freeze for a few minutes. I wonder if that's what happened to Jesus as this perfume ran in his eyes and stung. Uh, it was quite a messy thing. But yet Jesus said it was a good work, it was beautiful, and it was done uh, to set him apart for uh, his burial, which was to come. Now let's talk about this business of giving the money to the poor, right? Giving the money, oh, we, we, you wasted all this money, woman. You should have sold this perfume and given the money to the poor. Where does that come from in the Bible? Jesus said, of course, you will always have the poor with you. And he knew his Bible well because if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, an Old Testament passage, it says in verse 11, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I commend you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God's people are given the responsibility of helping care for the material needs of people who are disadvantaged in society. So you think about that ongoing obligation we have. Why then was giving to the poor not the right thing for the woman to do at that particular moment? Why did Jesus say, you won't always have me? when he has also promised the church, I will be with you always, or I am with you always. I think it's important to remember Jesus is not excusing us from our calling and our obligation to care for the needs of the poor, but it's one of those right place, right time, take advantage of your opportunities moments. This is a one of a kind, a once in a lifetime opportunity for this woman as Jesus is referring to his upcoming death. He will indeed be with his church always after his resurrection, as he promises in Matthew chapter 28. But there's also a sense in which uh, we have him here in this room, in this banquet hall, in a way that he won't be after his crucifixion. So uh, this is an opportunity for this woman to do something that maybe she didn't even recognize uh, was so significant, but it's preparing Jesus' body for burial. We talked about this a little bit in the sermon. Remember how hastily Jesus' body was hustled from the cross and put into the tomb on Good Friday. They didn't have time to prepare the body for burial according to the usual Jewish custom. That's why the women went to the tomb early on Sunday morning, fully intending to find a lifeless body that they could uh, anoint and set apart for burial. Of course, Jesus threw a monkey wrench in that plan by rising from the dead, and praise God that he did. 
All right, so uh, let's see. We're talking here about giving to the poor, taking care of the poor. Uh, one of the things that you will find in the church is this tension between caring for people's material and physical needs and using the church's resources in other ways perhaps to enhance uh, worship life or repair or construct or renovate facilities. And I would expect that uh, Vicar Brett's been around a little bit, Josh and Mr. Whitmer have been around. Those of you participating in Bible study at home, you've been around. You ever hear that when you uh, hear a proposal at church for some sort of a project? There will always be a curmudgeon who says, well, we should use the money for missions, or we should give this money to the poor and not just uh, build something. There is a need to do this, but there's also a sense in which opportunities present themselves and needs of God's people in a particular place dictate that it's the right place and the right time to use resources for these special projects. Now, I took it upon myself to prepare a slide, and maybe Mr. Whitmayer can put that slide up, and I'll show you some of the items. Just run through your mind, those of you that have been around the block three or four times. Have you ever had a church or a school come up with a project like this? How about building a new sanctuary? I'm sure there are some of the old timers here at Salem who were around in the late 1940s and early 1950s when this beautiful sanctuary was put up. School buildings and building additions. We have added on to our beautiful church building about, oh, 15 or 17 years ago. And we've added on to our school building a few times here at Salem. And those of you who have been in other congregations know what a challenge and a big undertaking that is. Stained glass windows, uh, how that can be a beautiful addition to a house of worship, but also can cause controversy. I can speak from firsthand experience about that one. A bell tower, uh, renovating bells or installing something new that could uh, share with the community. Let's say it plays hymns at several times during the day or rings out when worship starts. Here's a big one. This is, this is always controversial, right? A school gymnasium. What do we need a gymnasium for? We should give the money to the poor. We should support missions. Instead of putting up a school gym where all kids are going to do is play basketball. Well, you know, there's a need for physical fitness, for physical education. And sometimes you can even use your gymnasium as a worship space, as uh, many congregations are doing these days. Any kind of a statue, painting, artwork. Well, what do they say? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? And some people might think these are beautiful things, others maybe not as much. Putting up a steeple on a church. This, this church needs a steeple, needs a cross at the top of that steeple. And others say, what do we need that for? Uh, how about an organ? We have been blessed here at Salem with a wonderful organ. Remember, it was a few years ago we had that summer concert series. Mr. Whitmere did some recitals. I think it was the 40th anniversary of our organ. He continues to tell me it's in good working order, and our organist is in good working order as well, as far as we know, so we thank John for that. Um, musical instruments. Audiovisual equipment that we've been using during the pandemic in ways we never did before. New choir robes, uh, a coffee area or meeting space for after services, and even something like hymnals. My goodness, why do we need all these hymnals today? Well, you can see how easily the devil can use these things to divide God's people. And while there is an ongoing need for helping the poor, supporting the mission work of the church, sometimes resources and opportunities come together that make it possible for us to do things that will benefit God's people in a particular place. And I would just say there's nothing wrong with doing these things, provided we do them in a responsible way and as our Lord provides. All right, well, enough of my soapboxing about all these special projects going on in the church around the world. 
If you had any comments or questions, you want to grouse about how the church is using its resources, go on Facebook, let us know. Josh has a question or comment from home. What do you say? Actually, it's a question or comment from me. Um, I once heard a, a, a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, do sort of a, a Bible study on the good, the beautiful, and the true. And he referenced this passage as, um, as kind of proof of what, of what you're saying here. You know, the, the unnamed woman anointed not just Jesus' head, but as you said, it went down his whole body. And if you think of the congregation as the body of Christ, things that we do enhance our worship here, they enhance our spiritual, uh, our spiritual growth, our spiritual faith. I mean, we, we could baptize people, you know, with, with a Cool Whip canister or something like that, but that water contains the body of Christ. So we want to honor that, that container, uh, do the best that we can with it. And you can definitely go too far. You can have a baptismal font encrusted with diamonds and rubies and gold and all of that stuff. But we want to do honor to the body of Christ by using the best things that we can to enhance our spiritual life and our worship while we're here. Yeah, I think Josh makes an excellent point. It's always a tension, isn't it? Uh, between using our best and our finest, giving back to the Lord the first and the best of what he has given to us. That's how I define stewardship, and you've heard me say that over the years. Um, you look at this beautiful sanctuary here at Salem Church. People walk in, and I can tell you because it, it happened again within the last two weeks. Uh, someone stepped into our sanctuary for the first time. He was a, a a contractor we're doing some work with and he was just awestruck at the beauty and the design and the construction of our church building. Um, it took remarkable foresight and a big deal of commitment of time, energy, and money to construct this facility. Now at that time, uh, 60 some years ago, uh, this was an appropriate uh, worship space for the congregation's needs and it has served us well and continues to serve us well. If we were going to do it over again today in 2021, I don't think we would do it this way. Number one, we couldn't afford it. Uh, but number two, the needs of the church and the way the church carries out its work are different these days. Uh, demographics, attendance patterns, and so on. So we try to do the best job we can of being good and faithful stewards. But you're right, Josh, to, to uh, do things with excellence and uh, quality materials in a way that honors God and reflects our faith and trust in him is always desirable. Okay, we better get moving on because we've only got a couple minutes left. I uh, want to go back to this um, perfume, this ointment that we said is now running down Jesus' head and his whole body. And we referenced this in the sermon on Wednesday briefly, this quote from Ephesians 4 and 5. Maybe Vicar Brett can tell us a little bit more about the smell metaphor. I used the example of one of our junior high students in the afternoon and even Mr. Whitmare in the evening about walking in the house and everyone in the family saying, ah, oh, John is home, right? Because he smelled so sweet. What's that all about in the Bible, Vicar Brett? Indeed, and hopefully not just because it's chocolate syrup. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the question and the, uh, and the uh, Bible verses listed in the question. Uh, what smell metaphor does Paul use to describe Jesus' work for us? How does he and how does he describe Christians in 2 Corinthians 2? So let's read those three verses from 2 Corinthians 2. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? So let's... Let's briefly uh, look at that passage from Ephesians, which talks about the fragrant offering and sacrifice of Christ. This is a loaded phrase, because if you go all the way back to the Old Testament, when they would have been offering sacrifices, you could, you could, uh, it would have been a quite the smell to, to experience the animals uh, that were, uh, that were, that were being consumed and also the uh, the plants that were being and the, the fruits and the vegetables that were being consumed in in their sacrifice to God now 
A smell is one of the most visceral senses, right? You can probably you can probably imagine something that smells very good. You could probably picture in your head walking into your grandma's house on Thanksgiving or when your spouse makes something that one of your favorite recipes and you walk in the house and immediately you can tell that it's going to be a good night, right? And that also works in reverse. There are certain smells that you are wired to find disgusting. So this idea of smell kind of proceeding in front of someone, it could be something when you walk into a house or when someone who has a distinctive smell about them comes near you, that may be one of the first things you notice. Now, Paul says that uh, the, the, this, this kind of language of smell describes how we as Christians uh, share the gospel that just as when you approach someone who has a distinctive smell or even approach a place that has a distinctive smell, you, are, you, ought, you already know what to associate with it based upon that. And as Christians, people will know or should know at least that you are one redeemed by your speaking the, the gospel message to people, not, and not just through your mouth, but with your actions as well. So as Christians, this, this gospel, this good news permeates your life so that people around you, just as you would a smell of a, a great meal or, or, a, or a perfume that you are familiar with, it should be just as familiar to people who are seeing you and hearing your proclamation of the good news of Jesus. Um, now, this is something that is uh, that you will find is uh, pleasing to other Christians as we we uh, can as we engage in fellowship with one another. But unfortunately, sometimes is rejected by people around us. Uh, you know, s smells trigger certain reactions in people, and uh, and uh, unfortunately, that reaction is not always. Uh, a positive one and frequently this can occur because people misjudge the role of good works in the Christian life. This has been something that has been a controversy for literally thousands of years, right? Mm -hmm. So pastor, what else can you talk tell us about the role of good the proper role of good works in the Christian life? Now we've talked about this a little bit already based on Matthew chapter 6, Jesus sermon on the mount part of that gospel appointed for Ash Wednesday, Jesus warns us not to try to do good works to please other people or to show off before God. And I think the misjudging eyes that you mentioned from unbelievers uh, sometimes presume that that's why Christians do these things. And that's not the case. Uh, genuine Christian good works result from our faith. They're not an attempt to cause a right relationship with God. So we don't want to do our good works to be praised by other people or to show off before our Lord, uh, but they result from the saving work of God in us. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared beforehand that we should accomplish them. So the good works that we do are really God's works in us and through us. And with that, I think we're uh, running out of time. We're actually over time today, so uh, we've had some good discussion. Why don't we go to that conclusion paragraph on the study guide, and then we'll wrap up with our closing prayer. Indeed, and I'm glad you mentioned that God prepared those good works for us as Christians because this is the same that happened in our gospel reading. God prepared this good work for this woman to do at that time and at that place. Now, this gospel has no mention, and Mark's gospel has no mention of the resurrection. So you, as you remember, it sort of ends like a season finale. However, as the readers of Mark's gospel or the hearers of Mark's gospel are hearing or reading these words, this, the concept of burial will certainly foreshadow what is going to happen to Jesus, that he will be buried after dying on the cross. Um, so we cannot remember that it doesn't end there. And even though we are in our 
in our kind of penitential season of Lent, uh, we can look forward to the time where we can uh, again say our Alleluia's in rejoicing the good work of, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the work of our Savior rising from the dead. That is just a short time away. And Pastor, would you please lead us in prayer to finish us out today? <clears throat> I would be happy to. So let's close with this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, today in contrition we enter the holy season of Lent in order to meditate on the sufferings and death that you endured to save us. Help us never to misjudge the value of your sacrifice for us, but always to hold it as our dearest treasure and fix our eyes upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith. May your willingness to deny yourself, take up the cross, and suffer for us, inspire in us a hatred of sin <clears throat> and a zeal to follow your example for the sake of our neighbor. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. That brings us to the end of the first lesson in the Eyes on Jesus Bible Study. We'll be back again next Sunday morning at 9.20 a.m. We hope that you will join us. My thanks to Vicar Brett Jones, Seminarian Joshua Hahn, and Mr. John Whitmere for their help with today's Bible study. We thank all of you for joining us either on Facebook Live or by our telephone ministry. We look forward to being with you again next Sunday uh, at 9.20 a.m. as we keep our eyes on Jesus.